Welcome back to learnpiezo.org. Today we are going to be speaking about the shear um, actuation and sensing capability of a piezoelectric and this is lecture 15. So, I have discussed uh, uh, piezoelectric materials as being anisotropic by their very nature. I think in lecture two I go into that and uh, in other, other, other lectures as well. So, um, piezoelectric materials are naturally anisotropic, so they have uh, differences in the material properties depending on w uh, what um, geometrical side with regards to the polarization direction you apply forces on or you apply an electric field to. So drawing a three-dimensional coordinate system Z, X, and Y, we can then introduce a cube shape to sort of help us get uh, an understanding here and we know about application of forces uh, for example let's assume the z direction is the polarization direction so a stress in the z direction which should for example be a tension or a compression would then be no, denoted as um, whatever symbol you're using for stress. Let's, let's just use sigma three, um, and we could then understand d three three. You know the displacement or the charge created in the, the polarization change in the three direction is equal to here. So we have the input and then we have the output uh, a subscript. And the same thing could be understood by sigma x, which would be um, sigma 1. So if we have a stress in the 1 direction, d3, 1, which happens to also be equal to d13 then again we would have if you apply a stress here on this x direction you would uh, due to the Poisson's ratio we would have compression in the z direction which would then cause a change in polarization according to d31 and for PZT which is, which is a, with it, which is a uh, uh, it's not a single crystal material, so it has many less unique crystal directions. Essentially, what you have in a PZT structure, uh, and a simple way to understand it, I think I, I described it earlier, is it's like you have many little rods inside of a disc. So, all, let's say all these rods are held together by some substance with, of homogeneous material. So, if you apply a force in the Z direction, or if you apply a force outward, whether it be Y or X, it will not be the same. It's not exactly like this. So there is, very, there is a, it's much, it's not like a epoxy matrix, you know, a epoxy uh, substrate with, uh, you know, raw, you know, very stiff rods. It's not that different, but uh, there is this idea and you can understand just based, just trying to understand the material properties uh, and how they relate in the different crystal directions. Um, that the X and the Y crystal direction are equivalent. And I'll just write uh, for equivalency, I'll just use these wavy equal signs, um, approximately equal to, they're about, they're, you know, practically the same. Although, you know, the, for a real material, you'll need to define all these. So whenever you see D31, you know, D32 will be the same for the piezoelectric material as well, as well as D23 and D. One three, um, 
nozzle walls will be the same. Uh, and that's just due to uh, the crystal symmetry in this material. And as it has been pointing, as it has been pointing out to me, this is also called uh, orthogonally isotropic. Or you can call it anisotropic with this sort of um, matrix of, uh, uh, of material properties. What remains here for discussion and now is the shear, shear terms. So we also have shear and what we'll call the 6, what we'll call the 5, and what we'll call the 4. The 5 and 4 are equivalent in this case. And 6 would be the different direction. So in the other other terms, you know, as we noted, 3 was the unique direction. 1 and 2 are pretty much the same thing. They just correspond to other than 3, other than the polarization direction which is x and y. Uh, and in a similar way, the shear terms 6, 5, and 4 uh, are also different and similar in the same way. So we'll go over that now. So we'll put down our trusty block and I'll then draw our coordinate systems. Okay, that should be z, that'll be x and y. As you can see, it doesn't matter. Last time I wrote y and x, x and y, they all end up being practically the same thing. We'll assume a polarization direction and the thickness again. Um, so what is what? Um, when we apply a force here, a shear force, that is 6. And the two similar directions are if you apply a shear force here, we'll let's call that 5, and then or you can apply one here, and we'll call that 4. So 4, if you apply a shear force in that face 6, or if you apply a shear force in that face 5. So that is the uh, the notations that we'll, we'll continue forward with. <laughs> So there are coefficients, for example, V15. So if I apply an electric field in the V15 direction, and this is going to be an electric field applying the 1, 1, or the 1 direction, I will get a stress. You can just call this 1. Practically, it's not uh, different. So 1. And then we'll get a final product of strain in the 5 direction. So this would be strain here. So what would this look like? This would be a piezoelectric block. It's polarized in this direction. However, after polarizing it, what basically what we do is we strip the electrodes. We take them off. And we then deposit a new electrode on the top and bottom. Or what you could do is you could you could polarize all you could electrode all sides, make sure they're not electrically connected, and then you can just selectively remove this one and that the original polarization the original electrodes used for polarization. After this, you now have a place to connect your system, and you have equally potential surface by which charge can disperse through uh, throughout that those single surfaces so we up, then apply voltage here and according to and now we have a electric field this way and we have a dipole so a spontaneous polarization going that way so what happens is the dipole orients, it changes by a certain angle, not this dramatic, but it changes like that.
getting also slightly longer in that direction. Thus, we will now have shear. looking like this. See, we, we have now we have a shear strain, which whose angle here is actually in radians, is going to be our shear strain. And uh, the strain is related to the stress. Uh, so we apply a stress, the stress in the phi direction. Well, there's going to be no stress practically because this, uh, because the electric field, you know, it creates a stress which then causes this uh, shape to occur, which then relieves all of the stress. So this is there's no external stress occurring as you, as we discussed earlier. Whenever you apply electric field, the no stress state. The no stress strain of a piezoelectric material then changes. So I will now stop here for this brief introduction. So this was just a brief introduction of, you know, shear. Uh, we talked about uh, the different notations. We talked about these two. Um, I give an example, so D51, the effective D51 or the effective D14, it's all the same, it's all D15. So we only use this. So we reduce the number of different unique coefficients by just calling it D15 always for this case. Um, although you can write D51 and whatnot, uh, that's not going to matter. So, uh, so I give a brief introduction this time. Uh, we're going to continue. In the next couple of lectures in this series, we're going to talk about resonance uh, and we're going to, we can talk about different shear, different shear geometries. Um, other things which can uh, be of interest is uh, the full tensor notation. And eventually what we'll actually end up doing is we'll get into finite element analysis and how you account for shear in that way. Um, so I hope this introduction has been useful. Uh, Basically, we talked about the D15 and all these component coefficients. I'll continue in the next couple of lectures talking about uh, resonance, your geometries, also different devices that could use um, uh, the shear geometry and you know why it might be useful. So thank you for watching. I will uh, continue in the next lecture, and I hope to also see you there.